I'd like to talk about um, reactive web applications and what they mean beyond the buzzword because reactive has been uh, hyped quite a bit. Um, there, is a, there is an application after this talk, if you like this talk, please rate it. So what we're going to take about, talk about here is um, buzzword first design, is how do you build your uh, software infrastructure using only things you've heard in the media and on your Twitter streams? Um, <laughs> don't do this. Uh, you can do it at home, but don't do this for your job. Now, what I want to talk about is, is Reactive, which has been hyped quite a bit. And now, slowly, we see that it's actually something more than, than just a hype. And um, this talk will be in two parts. There will be uh, the first part, which is rather short, on theory of the evolution of web application architecture and the evolution of hardware. And then uh, there will be some uh, live coding most of the rest of the talk. And if there is some time left, um, I will talk a bit about deployment and load testing. If at any point you have a question, please uh, interrupt me and ask it. I like the sessions to be interactive. Don't be shy. Just if you don't understand something, if I go too fast, just let me know. Okay. A uh, word about myself. My name is Manuel Bernhard. What I do is that I help uh, established companies getting started with using reactive web applications and mostly with distributed systems, which is because that's what reactive applications are all about. Um, you can find more about what I'm doing on my website, manuelbernhard.io, and that's me scuba diving, uh, and uh, I live in Vienna in Austria, and this is not the Danube, I wish it was. Um, so scuba diving is one thing I do uh, as a passion when I'm not doing computer things. I wrote a book called Reactive Web Applications, which covers um, Play, Akka, Reactive Streams. The examples are in Scala. And uh, today, you're lucky, today uh, I just got uh, from my publisher uh, uh, an email that uh, it's 50% half, it's 50 off today with this code. Um, so if at the end of the talk if you're interested in this, um, you can use this code to get 50% off, which is awesome. And it was almost uh, going to be in print at this conference, okay? We almost made it with the production team, but we didn't quite make it. So it would have been, you would have been able to see it in print and get some copies, but yeah, it's not. So sorry about that. Um, so let's go and talk about uh, the architecture and the history of, of um, how the web application archi architecture has evolved. In the good old days, um, who remembers this? Who has been building websites with this? Okay, ah, lots of people. This was cool. You had your stash of GIF images that were animated and you would have turning back buttons. And on every side there was a compulsory construction GIF um, with this little guy that was uh, digging and showing that the site was under construction. We don't do this nowadays anymore. I don't know why I like this, but um, I think the times have changed. So um, we had HTM files because um, DOS was not supporting more than three letters. So we had not HTML, but HTM files. And all you had to do in order to deploy this application was to upload it via FTP to some server and then it was running. And that's it, that's the end of the story. It was great, it was so easy, uh, yeah. Fast forward a few years later, um, we had a very, uh, very, um, how shall I say, popular architecture. So three tier, we have an, an Apache HTTP server on, in the front, uh, an application server in the middle, or servlet server like Apache Tomcat, and the MySQL uh, as a backend database. Who used exactly this uh, setup? Who has worked with exactly this? Yeah, yeah. It was very popular. It was great. You know, you had only two arrows there. This is an arrow here, and this is an arrow, and an arrow uh, represents a network connection. And, um, and that worked nicely. You know, you, you could do things, um, but you couldn't do other things. So um, who can tell me what the next big thing is? What, what happened after that? PHP. I always get PHP. I don't know why everyone tells me that PHP happens. I know it happened, but uh, we don't need to talk about it. Um, <laughs> no, uh, sorry? SPA? SPA? SPA, single page application? Single page application. Yeah, that's a bit, that's also part of this uh, thing, but I'm talking in terms of architecture 
like a bigger change, where you move your, well, how you deploy things. Um, Application servers? That was more or less the same age. Without Apache, I would say. Sorry? Without Apache. Without Apache in there? Yeah, that's also. Um, soap? Soap? <laughs> yeah. yeah. OK, yeah, that's, um, that's not what. I, this is hard to guess. I don't know why. Nobody get, it's a buzzword as well. That's a clue. Huh? Cloud, 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 cloud. <laughs> so. I did not make this up, by the way. This is a client project. I came in, uh, and um, that was the thing we migrated away from, and we needed to extract the data from this. So you can count. You have MySQL, SimpleDB, Redis. Then you have data, metadata in SoundCloud, YouTube, and MixCloud. And there is some PHP in the middle. Um, and all of this, we needed to extract the data from this stuff. And we managed with Akka. Thank you, Akka. Um, but that was, that was interesting. So cloud, what happens when you use cloud is um, you, you have a lot more arrows. You have a lot more connections between things. Everything is in the cloud, and everything talks to everything else in the cloud. Um, and beyond you know, picking things at random, what I really mean to say here is that there is a lot more I.O. and a lot more network traffic happening. That's the key that there is a lot more network traffic. So if you're lucky and you deploy things uh, in, uh, on, on, uh, on some Amazon thing and everything is, is in the same data center, all the other services you use are in the same data center, it's kind of okay. But if things span across data centers across the globe, you start to see some hiccups and uh, things start to be less smooth. And so that's where, um, where things become interesting. So. Um, the next thing we have is, uh, and everyone talks about, is uh, microservices. So you take the idea of the cloud and you multiply it times thousands, and you end up with even more of this, uh, of this network connection, traffic exchanges, etc. cetera. And um, if, if, you, if you look at this, the first time I saw this, I was like, this reminds me of, of you know, um, <laughs> the flying spaghetti monster kind of thing. Because somehow, you know, you have to be able to track what, whatever happens. I mean, you see, it's not only me, is it? So <laughs> you kind of uh, need to track now uh, where your calls are going, what, what is going on at all. And um, I'm making a bit fun of microservices. They're a really, I think they're a, a really good invention. And they're going to be really useful for large organizations with a big engineering team. I think microservices are useful when you have a large team. If you don't have a large team, don't use microservices, I would say, because you're shooting yourself in the foot. Deploying and, and operating microservices are, is hard. There is an overhead there. Microservices help you scale a large team by uh, making it possible to work at a faster pace by having everyone work on a small subset of microservices. And in my opinion, that's why microservices are useful. But again, what we see is we have a lot more uh, network traffic. So when we think of network traffic and in the internet, we think of the internet like this. Yeah, we're the master of the internet. So I worked, uh, I studied telecommunication. I worked at a telco. And networks, they don't look like this. Networks look like this. Um, networks fail all the time. Networks are very flaky. Uh, there are teams that work uh, all around the clock in three times H hour shifts to keep the networks up. So then the question is, since everyone now builds these network distributed applications, how do we maintain a level of quality on top of this shaky foundation? And that is where reactive applications come in. So I, this is not an architecture itself. It's more of an architectural pattern that you apply onto something. And it has four traits. Who has seen this before, by the way? Most of you. I'm going to go quickly through it. You want to build responsive applications that are always there and that um, are fast to load. Because if they don't load fast, people will skip your site. Let's be honest. I mean, uh, but, uh, I think, uh, who was it? Amazon has uh, done a great study and showed how the page load time influenced the amount of sales. And uh, orders of milli hundreds of milliseconds of difference made had an impact on the sales. It's completely crazy, but it's what happens. 
In order to be responsive, you need two things. On one hand, you need to be resilient to failure. If one third party service fails, it doesn't mean that your whole site has to go down. It just means that this, this part, you will not show it in, in your front page or you will use, you will fall back to something else. You want to be elastic in order to be able to scale out and scale back in when there is a higher load, when you're, when you're launching something, when uh, your site gets uh, crowded by something. You want to be able to quickly deploy your application or have it run on more resources. And uh, lastly, in order to support all of this, the idea is to be message driven, which is to say that everything happens by messages being sent around your system, including errors, Fail errors, failures, etc., get, get uh, propagated using messages. So that was for the software part. Now, uh, in terms of hardware, because hardware, as we know, it never evolves, um, almost never. This is great, you know, this is like 566 megahertz. It's never obsolete, and it has, it even has 32 megabytes of RAM or something. So, um, on one hand, we have CPUs that have been uh, evolving. So now what we have is not any more single core CPUs or dual core or quad core. We enter the era of many cores. So this is the Talera Cadium um, CPU. It's not a GPU, it's a CPU. It has 72 cores, 72 hardware cores. So you get 72 hardware threads. This is great when you want to do things in real time or when you want to process things in parallel. You now, you now have this power to do things uh, at, the, at this kind of scale in this kind of really concurrent setting. Now, the only, and our phones, so this phone has, I think, four cores. Many phones now have eight cores. My machine here has uh, four cores and with hyper-threading, uh, kind of virtually eight cores. Anyhow, uh, we have all these cores. What do we do with all of our cores? We have this, which you do not see because um, it's, uh, but I will, it's too, too bad that you cannot see it. So I will, I'll make this load anyway by, so this is what happens. <laughs> I have one guy in the middle and he's dancing and he's really like, and everyone awkwardly around, like nothing else happens on the other CPUs. And that's, that's the sad reality of most software that we build, especially on, on phones and so on. Nobody uses really the power that's there because, well, it's, it's not easy. Um, but um, yeah, this is a great one. I could watch this all day, really. Um, so on the other hand, we have this. On one hand, with this. On the other hand, we, we know that in the future, we will get uh, the, the connection breakdown between machines will be even smaller. Like there is here uh, optoelectronic um, CPUs that, so you, you, get, you get, basically, you get connections between machines and between the CPUs that are much faster, okay? That are much, much faster. And, um, and so what, it really will matter at some point. The bottleneck will really be our ability to use the resources that we have. That's on the end of on the CPU end. Um, when we talk about memory now, there's a website called Yes Your Data Fits in the RAM, and you enter a number and you choose. Uh, you know, like here I selected terabytes, and then the website says Yes Your Data Fits in RAM, and if you click on Yes, you get a page of Dell, which tells you a machine with six terabytes of RAM, and your is I think Hewlett Packard. You can buy servers with six terabytes of main memory. And then the whole big data game changes because um, that's why things like Spark is, are taking off because all the intermediate steps that uh, Hadoop is saving on disk, that's a, you don't want this anymore. You have six terabytes of main memory. You just save everything in memory. You just compute in memory and you only save this, the, the end result. This is completely changing the game. It's like so many big data problems and people, ah, we have, we have hundreds of gigabytes. Well, you know, you can buy a machine with six terabytes of main memory and, and you can do all your computation memory. It's much, much faster than doing it on disk. So that's also entirely changing the game. 
what's well, also changing the game. I don't know. I think this is something many people missed. Um, last year, that came out. I remember I was sitting in a cafe in Zurich, and Intel and um, what was it? Um, X point, uh, no, Micron Technology. They announced a new kind of memory. There hasn't been a new kind of memory after NAND in 89. This is the first time there's a new type of memory. All of the memory we have is NAND, NAND flash. So this is up to 1,000 times faster and up to 1,000 times uh, more durable than NAND. And also, it's much denser than the, the memory that we have. Um, this is going to be coming. This is coming to a new line of Intel CPUs soon, and this will you know, cache lines, things like this, this will really affect the way that we will be able to use, um, to use our computers. This, this is really a game changer. I know it's not, it, it, I, I say this now, it's not visible now right away, but this is a game, game changer. So, <clears throat> on the one hand, we have hardware that's keeping on getting better and better. Hardware tries so hard to make software fast. Software tries so hard to make hardware slow. So um, we have all these great things in our hardware, but we really waste resources like there is no tomorrow. And this is sad. It's, I, it, I don't know, but my impression is when I load a website these days, it's slow. It loads all these fonts. It lo loads, loads all these pop-up windows and these ads and this da 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 da. And at the end of the day, you it's you get an impression that things are getting slower and slower rather than faster, which is completely insane. Anyhow, in conclusion, we are definitely moving towards many core and distributed systems. There is no way back from there. I don't think we can back up after that and go back to single machine kind of deployments. We have awesome hardware, but the software is kind of lacking behind. So in my opinion, what we need now as developers is to have, on one hand, explicit asynchronous programming. Asynchronous programming and explicit failure handling if we want to do great software. These are two building blocks that we need. And so in the remaining time, um, let's build together a small reactive web application. And our web application will look like this. We'll have a view, um, a controller, they will talk via WebSocket, there will be an actor, and um, we'll talk with the Twitter API. And there will be message passing around here, we'll use the concept of a future here, and um, an actor down there. All of this, and oh yeah, and, and a thing called a circuit breaker towards the end, which is an awesome little tool. Um, this is all going to be built with uh, the Play Framework, Akka, and um, on Scala. So let's get started. Um, let me show you just the, the start of our application, or le let me show you this. This is the application. It's the user interface. I hope you can see it. Um, that's an input box, and that's the send button. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, and what happens when you click, when you enter a text and you click on the send button is that it's sending that via WebSocket to the server. So on the server side, we have first the view that I just showed you. There's the input box here. There's the send button here. Um, and then there's a div in which I'm going to append whatever I receive. So I have a bit of JavaScript down here. I set up a WebSocket. When I receive a message, I print it out in the console and I append it uh, to this div as an HTML element. Nothing really exciting. And when I click on the button, I send the message over to the socket to the server. In my controller, I have nothing. So let's do something about this. So um, what I will first need in order to set up a, a WebSocket connection is um, I need an actor. And an actor is a small tool. Or a, an actor is, let me show you what an actor is. An actor is a very tiny object, lightweight. You can have millions of actors running in one single JVM that sends messages and receives messages. So here we have an actor that sends a message to another actor. Each actor has a mailbox in which they receive their messages. 
they receive them and process them in order. So inside of an actor, you got the illusion of of uh, everything happening in order, not concurrently, but in a synchronous way. You get an illusion inside of the actor. You're in a safe world in which you think inside of an actor that everything happens in order. When these actors interact outside of this world, everything is concurrent. But inside of the actor, you get to work in a synchronous fashion, which means that it's much simpler on, on us frail humans to reason in terms of concurrency when we have this illusion. They're, they're meant for long-lived asynchronous computation. Uh, actors, ACA actors have an address. They all live in, a, in a, an actor system and um, use the address to basically send messages from one actor to another. So here I'm, I'm building an actor um, and I say, when I have a message, when I receive a message, that's the reception part, I uh, want to, for the moment, for the first thing, I want to reply to whomever sent me this and, and as a, act as a pong kind, ping pong kind of thing. So I start, I log out that I received a message here. Um, and then I will reply. And out is the outwards channel. A WebSocket is a bidirectional thing. And so out is the, the path back to the, to the browser, OK? So here, when I want to reply, I say out, exclamation mark. So this is actually tell. So this method is tell, or this used to be called bang. So you say out, bang, message. These days, you call it tell. So you, this is a fire and forget operation. You send this off, and you forget about it. You don't care whether it, you know, it's being processed. You just send it off and you forget about it. Um, and I will just say, I will uh, make this a bit more explicit that this is being a pong here. OK. Um, I made an actor here. It's pretty simple, pretty small. I need to hook it up to the WebSocket. So in the Play Framework, there is a thing called a WebSocket handler. I can say accept with actor. I need to tell it what comes in and what comes out. What type do I receive? I could have XML, JSON, what's or not your own format. I'm going to be lazy here, and I'm going to receive strings and send strings out. OK? Um, but you could go and have some JSON, something more fancy here. So in there, I get now the request, the HTTP request. When you establish a WebSocket connection, you first have an HTTP request, and then you say upgrade, and you get back a WebSocket channel. That's how it works. And the Play Framework then sets up a, an actor that represents the connection from the server to the actor. That's called out here. And then I can uh, I, I pass it in my, um, my actor. In order to pass it in my actor, I need a sort of constructor for the actor, which are called props. Props are serializable. It's a sort of a serializable. Um, constructor of the actor, and there I go and I say WebSocket client, oh, um, props class of WebSocket client, and I pass it in out, and these are the props. So sort of a serializable constructor, and here I just go WebSocket client props out. The last thing I need to do, or there's two more things I need to do. Uh, play is an MVC framework. I have routes, so I go in there and I say uh, at slash socket you will get your web socket. And in here I use this uh, notation and then I get my socket. Uh, and one last thing before uh, I'm ready to go. In my view, I also need to infer to, to say what address it is. And there again, this is all very type safe. So I go routes application socket. WebSocket URL, and this generates the URL. If anything changes in the routes file or in my uh, methods in my controller, it's all compiled. So if I make a mistake, this will not, this, the compiler will warn me about it. Let's see if this works. It doesn't. Oh my god. So um, this is IntelliJ that was not helping here. This is not a unit, this is a receive method. Um, so here I go. Let's see. If that works, it works. Okay, great. So uh, we did the first step. 
Good. Um, let's start and, and do something more interesting, which is connecting to Twitter. If you want to connect to Twitter, you need OAuth credentials. Um, and I don't want you to watch me type in all sorts of OAuth credentials. So what I did here, I fast forwarded and now, oh, one more. And here I get my credentials, okay? This is boring stuff. This is API keys sort of things. We don't need to do this in live. Um, I'm going to change this here and now I'm going to make a call using the WS library of play um, to the to the search API of Twitter. And I'm going to say with query string, and my query will be the message that I receive in the actor. And I'm going to um, sign this thing with a key, uh, with a OAuth um, WS signature. Um, so it's a OAuth calculator, which has a key and a token. Keys and tokens I, I have down there. So I just go um, in there and I say case key token. I move all of this in here. Now I have my key and token and I, uh, I make a get request here. Okay. So I'm just basically instructing this thing to uh, pass in Q to this API and assign the request. And this is a future. This thing here, uh, it's a future of a WS response. It's, I will eventually get this in the future. Not right now, but in the future. So it's not a Comson Corba future. It's incredible that Corba still is in there. Um, a future is is a kind of a box that, once it's completed, either contains a successful WS response, in my case, what I was expecting, or it doesn't contain anything, but it keeps, it keeps hold on the exception that I have. It keeps the failure, doesn't throw it out, okay? It keeps it. Um, it's for short-lived asynchronous computation. You, you do this once and then it evaluates and you're done. Um, you, the only state it holds is, is whatever it completed to at the very end. And futures can be composed together, and we'll see how failure, how we do failure handling with this. Um, so what I will do here is I will just take uh, whatever response I have, um, and I will send that out. Yeah, I will send the body out to my browser. So if I do this now, it will fail because. I need a, an, ex, an execution context. An execution context is the thing you run your future against. It's a threat. It's backed by a thread pool. Uh, it's something that is going to run uh, your your future. So, if I if I'm inside of an actor, I already have one of these execution contexts available because also the actor needs something to keep it running. And um, this is the implicit well, execution context. Uh, each actor has a context, and this one contains the uh, dispatcher, which is itself an execution context. And then I can use that in order to run my future inside of my actor. So let's see if that works. So what do we search on Twitter? Scala days. days. Usually I get cats, but let's say Scala days. OK, great. Uh, yeah. So. We get a result, but it's not very nice. So let's make this a bit nicer. So um, I will do this the fast way. All I did here, um, I'm not. I'm kind of cheating to go faster. What I did here is just I'm parsing the JSON and I extract the text of the status. Okay, nothing very fancy. But if I reload now. Here we go, and we have our latest Scala Days uh, tweets. Okay, cool. Except that this is not reactive yet because we haven't handled any kind of failure. Let's suppose that Twitter goes down. So I will just call them and ask them to go, no. Um, 
Twitter going down is something we can kind of simulate by simulating that the, the request takes a long time to proceed, okay? So here, um, or rather, we will set an, an unrealistic expectation as to how fast the request is supposed to uh, proceed. So I will say I'm expecting my request to take one millisecond to complete, which is completely unrealistic. Um, and what happens then? Can anyone tell me what will happen now when I run this? Sorry? I will have a failure in the future, yes. How will that manifest? Uh, will I see, how will I see that here or in the console or anything? You see nothing, yeah. Exactly, so I can do this many times. I can look at my console and I see absolutely nothing. And that is because the future keeps the exception inside. It doesn't blow up, it keeps it. And that is how, when you work with futures, you need to handle failures. You have a recovery here, and then you can uh, match the kind of exception that you have. I use non-fatal. Non-fatal is a, a utility that um, basically it says, as long as it's not something like a virtual machine error, an out of memory error, a stack of things you cannot possibly recover from, then it will not catch them. Because these things, it doesn't make sense to catch them because you're, you're screwed anyway. So um, we, use, we use this matcher here. And then um, instead of, then I will just tell the client, oops, something went wrong. And I give him the, the reason. And then the only thing I need to do is here, since this is expecting now JSON, this is not very nice. I could give it back JSON, but I'm lazy, so I'm not giving back JSON. I just catch this thing, and then I say um, append message, um, and then e event.data. Yes, yes. OK, let's try this. Yep, here we go. We get our exception back. That's great, but it's not good enough because this is not how you should do failure handling of a future inside of an actor. This is how you do hand exception handling of or, or failure handling of a future when you are using a future standalone. But if you're inside an actor, there is something else much better that you can use, and that is called the pipe pattern. <clears throat> the pipe pattern is a bridge between futures and actors. And what it does is that it kind of takes the completed the result of the completed future and sends it to another actor. That's the idea between actors behind actors is that you send things around uh, from one actor to another. And um, this is called a pipe. So how do we use a pipe? Let's see that. First, I need when I send something from one uh, actor to another, I need a protocol. So I will devise a small protocol. Uh, search. Results here with my text and um, and case and a search failure with my throwable yes and then instead of sending this out directly I just wrap it in my protocol result dot body and uh, when I recover I wrap this in the search failure. So I wrap this in my, in my message protocol. And then I use the pipe pattern. Pipe. And this result here, I say pipe to the actor I want to send this to. And the actor I want to send this to, I'm not going to create another actor here. I'm just going to send this to myself because I'm going to do the error handling here. In a real other scenario, you would send this maybe to someone else. Now I just want to send it to myself. So how do I do this? Well, I match this message. So I say, case search result. With my result, I am sending this out to the client. And um, case search failure. Case search failure. I am sending this same thing out. So in principle, we should get the same result here, the same return. Um, Scala days. Yeah, this is still failing. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
don't understand why you're doing this. Why I'm using the pipe pattern? OK. Um, it's, it's, it's producing the same result, but the, it's, the philosophy of the actor model is to work with messages. So here in this very simple result, yes, I'm completely with you. This is not really, uh, this is not, you don't see the value here because maybe it's too simple. Huh? That's uh, something you, you wouldn't see. But if you work with the actor model, you really want to build actors in such a way that what all they do is receive messages and um, you, you don't want to have another kind of model of doing uh, the uh, failure handling than the than model that you have in your, in your message. Does that make any sense? Does, does that answer your question? Or, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's something that um, you start to see the value when you have a larger actor system and you, have, you do want to, for example, centralize error handling and move error handling, for example, to one actor that sort of keeps track of all the errors and, and does error handling, or you propagate this to the supervisor of the actor or something like this. So when you, when you do the future uh, recovery inside of the actor directly uh, with the future, with the recover method, you kind of lose this ability. It's to use always this kind of channel use the messages as, and message passing as, as a means for uh, failure handling as well. It's more of a philo yeah, of the design idea of behind the actual model that you, everything is a message. OK. Um, we can talk more about it later. I can show you some more concrete examples of, of how it actually looks in a, yeah. So, uh, let's just check if it still works. Yeah, I still get uh, my results here. Okay, cool. So this was the pipe pattern. Um, we still have some time. And um, let's talk about something, which is circuit breaker. We all have circuit breakers in our homes. I mean, at least I do. When you use electricity, you have circuit breakers. Um, these things are... Uh, what you hear when you plug in your dishwasher, your vacuum cleaner, and your uh, electric oven, and um, the hair dryer and the toaster at the same time, and then the circuit breaker trips. So this is the same idea here. Um, there are three states. The closed state, where everything works well. The open state, where it just tripped. And then after it trips, the circuit breaker will attempt to reset itself. It's going to be in half open state. It's kind of unsure yet if things are OK. And then after a while, if requests come back in and, and do not fail, then it will close itself completely and uh, it will, everything will be fine again. This thing is tremendously interesting when you have a legacy backend system that you expose on the web or or to uh, another place where it, there is a much higher set of, a uh, much higher pace, let's say. Because you do not want to overload your backend system because otherwise you end up with cascading failures. Everything sort of is overwhelmed. And so this thing will trip and effectively protect your, your backend system from being overwhelmed. Now, in our example, the backend system is Twitter. So it's going to be hard to overwhelm it, um, but just in order to show you that we can use circuit breakers, I will show you how, how, how we, I would use this here. So I will uh, create a breaker, which I call circuit, circuit breaker. And uh, a breaker needs a scheduler. A scheduler tells it how to use the time, so I can use just the one that uh, I can, the system gives us. Um, the maximum failures before a trip, I will say two. Um, the call timeout, um, before I also say that this, this kind of doesn't work anymore, I will use five seconds. And the reset timeout, before I have confidence enough to reset myself, I will also use five seconds. Um, and here I just need to teach this about the concept of a duration. Here we go. So the breaker is something that I will put between my call, myself here and my call to Twitter. Okay. So in here, I will not do the failure handling anymore because that's what I want my breaker to do. It's when something 
it's not happening as according to plan. I want my breaker to take care of this. And then what I say, okay, and what I say here is I have uh, my mapped result. And then I use the breaker. Um, whoop, to invoke this and the result I pipe to myself. Okay. Um, let's reload this. Oh, okay. Uh, what I also want to do, sorry about that, is I want to actually show that something is going on. So when, when I trip, I will print that out. I will say logger.error breaker open. When I say on half open, I say warning breaker half open, uh, hang in there. And when I'm closed again, I am going to also say uh, breaker closed. So this will give us a sense of, uh, of this breaker uh, happening uh, or doing its job. So I said I'm not going to overwhelm Twitter here. It's not something I can, f I can try. You know, I can come in here and click really fast, but that will not work. Uh, I'm not going to overwhelm them. So instead, what I will uh, do is, again, I will use my trick from before. I will set an unrealistic request timeout so this future will fail. Um, okay. So now, if I do this a few times, more than two, um, and I look at my logs, you see the breaker is open. Then, after some time, it attempts to reset itself, so it goes in half open state. But if I continue now, since all I get back are exceptions, because all I do is failing all the time, I will never be able to close myself. So how do, we, how do I prove to you that I'm not just making things up and this, this really works? Well, I'm going to, Hang on a second. yeah. Where is the, which code doesn't run if the circuit breaker is tripped? Because it looks like. Oh, okay, which code doesn't run? This is not being rerun. This is not being re-evaluated. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so you get a message in here, okay? You get a message in here. Every time I click, I get a new message. And then this thing is being, um, or should I say, this thing, okay, so now, now it makes sense. So now I made this a definition and not a value, sorry about that. Um, so this is gonna be, and here again, this is gonna be evaluated here. Yeah. Um, and then, um, yeah, you, okay. Yeah, sorry, I forgot to change the vals and defs. If I keep it a val, it's going to be run anyway, so I, I lost anyway, but from one thing to another. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to say var timeout. I put this on one, um, or that's a bit too high in here. Okay, let's put it in here. So I start with one, no, that actually, sorry about that. Um, I start with the unrealistic expectation that Twitter will answer in one uh, millisecond. And if I'm half open, I will set that to something more realistic, like one second. And I'm going to use this here. So that after we have, have been in half open state once, we will reset, we'll change the timeout and then things should work again. So let's do if that, let's see if that works. Uh, Scala days. Uh, okay, once, twice. And we trip. Now we need more traffic coming in in order for the breaker to attempt to its reset itself. And after a while, we see that the breaker is closed and we get messages back. So this is a tool that you can use in order to protect your legacy systems and avoid cascading failures. And it's pretty, pretty neat. We have 10 more minutes left. So let's talk a bit about, um, any more questions on this? Or do we? move too fast or not, or maybe there is time for question in the end, anyway. So let's talk just a bit about deployment. So how do you deploy a reactive web application? Um, well, if you deploy it only on one host, you're kind of lost because that's not the idea, right? If your host is, uh, is down, if your machine burns, then, then you, you're not, not reactive. So what you want is uh, deploy on several machines. You want this to be elastic, and doing this on your own is hard. 
if you do this on your own, good. I mean, this is hard. There are whole companies that do only this, that this kind of ops, and building Elastic Ops is hard. So what I always say is use a managed service or a, man a solution that, that does this. For example, Lightband has this thing called the conductor um, that, lets, that sets up a cluster. Um, and the great thing about the Lightband, so you can run a Play, Akka, but also other kind of uh, applications. You can run Docker on this. So you can run any kind of applications or legacy applications that you have. It will set it up in a clustered environment. And the great thing about this is that um, it has automatic network partition resolution. If your cluster is cut off because one data center is cut off from the other one, or something bad happens on a network, it is able to sort of um, detect which partition is in minority, which, which who should uh, turn itself off because a cluster node will otherwise keep on humming along and when when the network uh, is back again um, and these faulty nodes are up they're going to be out of sync and you will have havoc between your um, between your cluster nodes so you don't want this and this does this um, network partition resolution automatically it's pretty great then deployment wise um, a managed service that I um, use quite a bit is clever cloud because what they have is automatic scalability horizontally and, and vertically. I don't, because Horu, Heroku doesn't have this, at least not that I know of. I didn't check yesterday, but to the last, that I know they don't have this. So what does it mean is that you have two sliders here, uh, the horizontal scaling, how many nodes you want, and what kind of vertical scaling you want in terms of instance um, sizes. And when you have this uh, enabled, um, the algorithm that Clever Cloud uses will try to optimize the price so that you pay the, less, the least amount of money as possible uh, in terms of when, when more load comes in, it brings up e either more nodes or it scales up the different nodes so that uh, the pricing is optimum. Um, and then lately, lastly, the last thing I want to talk about is load testing. Is it on top of hardware? This? No, no, this is on top of uh, real hardware. So um, it's not Amazon. This is uh, this is really you know why you, I mean this is a pretty s solid stuff, um, and they make awesome T-shirts and stickers. Uh, they're not here today. I th I don't think, but uh, they have awesome T-shirts. Uh, so <laughs> that's why you should use it. So um, load testing. Because how do you test? I mean, you can do the, the usual kind of unit testing and integration testing, but what is really interesting when you have a reactive web application is, or a reactive application is how do you load test it? And for this, we, uh, there is this tool called Gatling that's built on top of Scala, Akka, and Netty, and um, it fires at your application. So what you do is you record what, um, a real user scenario. And most testing or load testing tools, like if you use AB, uh, Apache benchmark, then uh, you only throw requests at it. It's not very realistic. Users, they behave in different ways. So here you set up Gatling, which acts as a proxy. You configure it as a proxy um, on, in your web server, and then you can go in the server uh, in your web browser, and then you can go on your application, click around, and simulate a user doing something, filling in forms, clicking on buttons, what's or not, browsing pages, reloading pages, and all of this is being recorded. At the end, what you get is a large file with all the, what the user does, and you can use that in order to simulate these users coming in. So you say, I do nothing for four seconds, then I ramp up to 100 users over the time of 10 seconds, then I add 10 users at once. You have many different ways in which you can simulate and add more users to this. You can be really creative, you can record different kind of scenarios, and you can really try to simulate real users using your application and then launching them towards your application. What you get after running uh, the whole thing on your application is nice graphs showing that this application completely failed here. Uh, all the requests are failing. I mean, most of them are failing. This is really not what you want. You get um, your response time distribution graphs, which is re really useful. This is a bit better here, actually. Uh, because um, you have only a very small percentile that's 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 not too slow, uh, that's like at around one second here. That's a much. This is this is not the graph for this one. This is much better here. Um, and so what what you have really is um, you get a good notion of how your application is doing. Now the only thing with Gatling is that you can only launch it from one machine. You can only run it on one machine. 
you can take an Amazon XXXL instance and throw that against your application. But what's also interesting is what happens when you have many real machines talking to you. And so the next thing that I'm going to tell you is something that is uh, only for educational purposes. So because this is working with bees with machine guns. And uh, in, in effect, what I'm going to tell you is how to run a distributed denial of service attack on a, on a site. So um, this is a Python uh, script that you can use. You hand it over you, your Amazon EC2 credentials, so you trust the whole thing to do the right thing. And then uh, you, s you start up a swarm of bees. Uh, yeah, these are the credentials. This is how you configure the credentials. And uh, don't forget, if you ever want to do this, to set the debug flag to two so that you get a notion of what's going on. And you, s you set up a swarm of bees. Um, and then you say attack this target, and it said you know it starts 400 Amazon EC2 micro instances and launches them with AB against your your um, your page where whatever you told it to attack. If you do this, and I talk because I done this and by experience is that do not so you what you do after the attack you say bees down so you call off your swarm, okay. But don't forget to log in to Amazon and um, delete the instances. Because an instance that's not running still costs something. So I had a nice bill at 400 instances running for one month. Um, not running, but the hard drive. So this is something, don't forget to do this. If, if you use this, don't forget to delete the instances afterwards. And so this is a tool that you can use as well. And I think we're through. Um, OK. Well. Thank you very much, and um, yeah.